click the blue go live button and all's going to be well. Click. And we're live. It is Friday, February 4th, 2022. 4.59 p.m. We're a minute early today, and I want to tell you why we're a minute early today. Because Kate is in Vail, and uh, she got hungry, and she was uh, she texted me and said, Hey, can you captain the show today? And I was like, I'm in the middle of a meeting, but I'll get off, and I'll jump on, and I'll captain the show. So I did, and I thought I was late, but I was actually early, because that's kind of like the neurotic You're, sort of person I am. I'm yes. compulsively early on, on time. And so then Kate, who was also worried that she was going to be late, she showed up because she didn't want to. Uh, and of course, our guest, who is a it's like super supremely punctual. genteel <laughs> individual who's super here, punctual. Nice. So we were all ready. And then it was time to go live. And we went live a minute early. And if you missed the first minute of In Lieu of Fun, uh, I have to say you have not missed much today. <laughs> we are not allowed to have fun anymore, but we are allowed to have my Brookings colleague, Tom Wheeler, who I wrongly introduced yesterday as a particularly funny guy for a telecommunications lawyer. He is, in fact, a particularly funny guy. He is, in fact... You can fact, just say you went to Michigan Law School, Tom. Yeah, he just... Uh, I would, I would he isn't actually that. a lawyer like me, not actually a lawyer. Still a funny guy. Tom, welcome back to the show. Hey, great to be with you both. Yeah, this is so fun. Last time we hung out, Tom, it was in a Brookings call about a an entire i think i don't know what would you what was the name of like the thing that we were that were is it going to be a book it's like you're going to be a compendium about 230 basically yeah some, some bunch of papers anyway it's a, yeah. yes that, that, that ben was cracking the whip on if i recall correctly you know yeah he was giving us a two we do two need two to deadline. produce something by god <laughs> what are you going to write about i think that was basically the tone that's well yeah. that's actually what i always sound like when i'm not on in lieu of fun <laughs> this is this is just the like you know the outward face of Joan Crawford and the like internally it's like you know mommy dearest kind of situation Tom I do want to say that like we're kind of it was like the 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 like the me being in the hotel lobby of some place at like 450 as like and them handing me my key card and me being like sure as I carry up like a tray of pretzels up to my room and like all my luggage and then go live with you like five minutes later is like pretty much like exactly if you're gonna do a show for every single day at five o'clock in the afternoon hey it, it, exactly and I, I just want to say to all the people uh many of you are not going to be greek chorus members you're going to be on youtube who are going to be upset that kate is eating on the show mm -hmm. i haven't turn eaten off anything now. today turn it off now kate's hungry she might eat something there was no it's, food on my american airlines flight yeah i mean the flights don't have food anymore they don't feed us anymore we're not allowed to have fun anymore so when we yeah, show but did up, you see the southwest southwest has decided to let alcohol back on the planes well that's good oh wait that's wait, important wait okay so i haven't been flying in a while and i missed this but the guy next to me was only like it was like noon i guess somewhere and, they, and they, there's no jimmy buffett song about that but maybe right. there should be <laughs> like but it was noon somewhere and he was like can i have a bourbon and like this and the lady was like we don't have any alcohol on the flights and i was like oh that's weird i've never been on a flight that doesn't have alcohol i used to like take this I used to fly between Boston and Baltimore when I was in law school because my partner was living in Boston. And I would watch this guy suck back like on a 45 minute flight, like five screwdrivers, like on like, <laughs> and, like at nine o'clock in the morning. And I was like, yeah, I mean that. So anyways, is this like a new rule? I didn't this is even a commentary that you haven't been flying recently. Yes. This is a com. I used to fly twice. I used to fly twice a week, Tom. Like my partner was just saying this. He was like, "This is crazy. You were so out of practice." I'm like completely out of practice. It's actually, you know, I mean, it, I used to travel all the time, and you were yeah. all it gave, it gave you something to complain about, right? Oh God, yeah. I'm flying to so and so. I miss it. You know. I am so with you. I didn't know I missed it. Yes, but the semester started. And I 
you know, I sometimes teach this class up at, up at Harvard Law School. Uh, and this semester, uh, back when it looked like the Delta, remember the Delta wave? It, yeah. Long ago, there was this thing called the Delta wave and it was fading. And so they asked me if I wanted to teach in the semester and I said, sure. So I agreed to teach my little class, which involves flying up once a week. And uh, so the last two Tuesdays, I have flown up to uh, Boston on Tuesday and flown home on Wednesday. And it has been such a pleasure yeah. to yeah. leave, you know, wake up in the morning a little earlier than I normally do, get in a cab, go to the airport, go through. I, I've never loved TSA more. It's like, sure, you want to look in my bag? You want to look in my toiletries <laughs> kit? Have the, at it, dude. I'm so excited <laughs> for you to see my razor. So that's, um, that's the last time I flew to. So I'm, I'm doing the same trip up to Cambridge, you know, for about a week, a month uh, these days. I, I recall... Then the last time you and I were both in Cambridge at the same time, um, you had some convenient excuse as to why we couldn't go out and get a beer together. But I don't I haven't harbored. Anything. I'm there every yeah, Tuesday this semester. And if you're going to be there, let's uh, let's I'll be let's, there. Let's, let's I'll be it. there. I'll be there uh, Tuesday, the 21st. I'll be there that week. Of February. Yeah. Let's have dinner. Yeah. I, I, okay. I'm, we'll, I'm going to send you a calendar invite. I'm also in town on that that Tuesday. Oh, we're we're all getting together. Well, my problem is I already. I thought you were going to say that you're. I already have a dinner, but I'll we'll figure out. Oh well, let's have a drink after dinner. We'll figure out something. We'll figure out. Something. Who's looking for convenient excuses now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I do want to say that. So, Tom, do you know what Ben did when he first, like, when we were first kind of allowed to travel? Um, which was, I found to be incredibly charming and I still haven't been able to finagle it because I've just been too busy, but he was, you were taking trains everywhere. Yeah. You took I, the train everywhere. It was I amazing. just am tracked around the country, which yeah, was but, super fun. But I made the decision not to, I mean, seriously, I'm on the, you know, the back and forth to New York routine. I mean, you break into two groups. Are you a plane person or a train person? Right. And I've always been a train person. Yeah. Um, and um, but but when I started traveling again post COVID, I decided, hey, wait a minute, I can spend an hour in a tube where there's constantly recirculating air and uh, or I can spend three hours in a vehicle with, that, that isn't. OK, and so I decided but, what the heck I'm going to fly. But here's the here's the difference. So I agree with you about New York. Uh, it's. Uh, that's a tube with recirculating air. But if you're going far, you get one of those cabins where you have a little room to yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the doors are closed. And it's much more expensive than flying, by the way. It, there's yeah. no good argument for it except yeah. pleasure. It has a little bed. Uh, and you can do in lieu of fun from it, which we've, we've, we've done. Um, and... Um, and I love the Amtrak uh, uh, long distance, but you're right. The medium dif distance where there are no, where there's no cabins is, yeah, you may as well be on a flight. Yeah. It's so here's longer. a factoid. For, here's a factoid for you. You're talking about doing in lieu of fun from a train, okay? By the way, it didn't work that well. Well, it, Kate kind of carried the. It's a hand Carried off. the ball. But 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 the first cell phone service was on the Metro Liner uh, between Washington and New York, paid for by the Department of Transportation. He used to have those pay phones on the Metro Liner, you remember? And that was the first example of a, a cell site getting your signal, and then you would move through it, and it would pass it off to another cell site. But they didn't have the computing capacity to be able to um, to do what we do now with with cell phones, which is to figure your signal strength and then get ready to hand off. And so there are little trip wires on the tracks. And when the train would go over the trip wire, it would send the message saying, OK, get to the next cell. But and that was that was the first cellular installation in the United States. And what year was that? That was like in the seventies, mid seventies. So you could I make mean, a call from a... Amtrak in the seventies. Yeah, it was a it, it, yes. 
There was a, there was a truly a payphone on each car. So it's funny. It's funny that this is where the conversations led because I have spent the last as I know it has nothing to do with the paper that you read, Tom. But like the but I've spent the last six months kind of digging back into the telephones, the privatization of telephone and the baby bell um, breakup right. Um, right. and like the early 80s. And then um, and also kind of reading some of the theorists like um, Sabil Rahman, who has argued for making truly making, everything, making everything yeah, a common carrier, making everything a common carrier or a public utility like not exactly the same thing under the law, but close enough. And it was very funny because I was driving across the mountains uh, to get from the airport to 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 here today. And um, my cell phone signal was coming in and out. But as I was going in and out of the mountains, I like the one thing that didn't waver were a couple of pieces of infrastructure. There were roads, there were railroads, and there were telephone, above above ground telephone lines that were still stretching across the mountains. And it like kind of occurred to me that that pushed for like an infrastructure at that level that is was like <clears throat> of like you're putting in either publicly or privately that much kind of it hasn't happened in in a while. Um, but then I was kind of like, well, maybe I'm just actually thinking about it the wrong way and maybe I'm missing something huge that's happened, some big piece of hardware. Um, there have been cell phone towers, of course, that have gone in all over the place. Um, but do you think do you think that there's going to be an age where like I was kind of this is mostly what I was thinking was just like when you point up to the telephone wires that are still like they're going to be vestigial, that they're just going to be like these that they're going to be kind of this vestigial organ that is like or infrastructure that is like stretching across the country and the people are going to be like, oh, yeah, those were the telephone wires that we used to like transmit all of our data across? Or do you think that like they're always going to have some level of function? They being the antennas, the wireless The antennas, the, yeah. no, no, not just the antennas, the wires, the actual physical wires. So the wire, the wires are, are going the way of all flesh. I mean, the, the name of the game is is fiber. And it-, it Yeah. And for those who don't know the difference, is what is the fiber. difference between fiber and wires? Yes. I, I was also fiber, going to ask fiber, you to... fiber is glass yes. and um, wires optics. are wires are metal fiber and it takes and, and down the glass goes a laser a in, in different in different colors um, and so here's the here's the interesting interesting thing and, and we're going through this right now with the passage of the infrastructure bill there's going to be um, 62 billion with a B spent to build out unserved areas, another 20 billion to connect uh, uh, individuals uh, who today can't afford uh, access to uh, to high speed fiber, high, high speed connectivity. Um, and there was a debate early on about whether it should be fiber or wireless or whatever, and and. And the fact of the matter is that we need to all be, in, and I think we are now, in a fiber-first environment because fiber is the physical transportation manifestation of Moore's Law. There is a thing called Keck's Law, K-E-C-K-S. And if you put, you know, we all know that Moore's Law was, you know, up and to the right, like this for the, the processing power of, of chips, Keck's law is parallel to it. And when you stop and think about it, you go, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. Because what is fiber? Fiber is this light transmission system that then has computers, chips, um, in the midst of it and at the end of it. And if you want to change the throughput of the uh, of the pathway, you change the computing power. And if computing power has been going up and to the right in terms of capability and down to the left in terms of cost, you see the same thing on fiber. So 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 the difference between fiber and wire is that there is there is only so much that a wire qua wire 
can carry in terms of capacity, but fiber, as you tweak with the light going through it, as you tweak with the uh, computing power on the ends and in the middle of it, has a opportunity to continue to grow. And so what we okay, want so to do to have to get to your question, Kate, what we want to do is we want to make sure we get fiber everywhere because then that will enable all this other stuff. So what, <clears throat> let's slow down and walk through that point because I think it's a point that a lot of people don't understand. A fiber cable is really just a, a bunch of strings of glass. It's a bundle um, uh, of sometimes hundreds of hair thin fibers of each of them are wrapped in some kind of an insulation. Um, and, um, and you're pulsing light through it basically correct. instead of electricity. Correct. Why is that better than a copper cable? You're also pulsing, uh, electromagnetic, uh, radiation through it. Uh, only you're pulsing it in the form of an electric current. Why is it, why are you able to do more with a fiber optic cable than you <clears throat> There's are less with, loss. with copper? <laughs> you know, you know, Ben, I, you know, I may play a lawyer, even though I'm not one, but I never try and play a physicist, even though I'm not oh, one. Oh, but I can play this a little bit. And, like, uh, because so Kate, Kate, but, so, but Kate, Kate <laughs> talk, I mean, the, the, the attenuation, the issue is attenuation. Right. There is less attenuation, um, but take it away, Kate. Well, I mean, it's not it's not like super complicated at a really basic level. And I, I live with a physicist, so I have the benefit of having talked about this a, a whole bunch of times. Um, but basically, like light is just um, light and fiber optic cable can transmit more with less loss than le like less loss of energy and with less kind of need for insulation. So like electricity is a constantly leaking mechanism or form of energy to pulsate down a wire and the more that like the longer it's going the more chances of loss or data or like anything or just kind of conductivity that you have and when you have basically like a fiber optic cable you don't have those issues that is based on light and not electricity there isn't like it's not going to be there's not going to be the same issues of loss like you're just going to be able to like basically have a a mirror held up and the light will continue to shine down and like it doesn't you don't have to like wrap it in multiple layers of like of insulation to a to a you know to stop the electrons from escaping so basically like a, like this is the most kind of like fifth grade level of explaining it but it's like just essentially it just is there's less loss that can carry more signal for longer and it takes a lot less energy from the get-go to get it there. Like that's, you know, kind of Kate, we, we have just been, we have just had a review of what Kate's dinner table conversation is like, you know? Yeah, no, it's like, it's, except, yeah. except without the, uh, without the, uh, the, uh, Kate, comments. don't oh. be ridiculous, <laughs> snarky comments that John is he's typical. Yeah. Uh, yeah, John for. is surely like, like bending, like, why would you summarize it? Like he's like finding some type of, I'm sure that I'm not like, this isn't perfect. I haven't summarized it for a long time. Kate, but this why did that. you bring home a cormorant today? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain physics to you. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, um, he's, he's good for these things. Uh, that's why I keep him around. All right. Uh, Kate, you gave Tom a paper to read. Oh yeah, Tom, like you uh, yeah. you read Kate's paper. I I'm just gonna like sit here, put my hands back, and uh, listen to the conversation. Well, Tom, I can't remember what you had said in that two thirty meeting that we had that made me think that you would that this in this paper would be of interest to you. But essentially, I think what the paper is trying to get people to focus on is something and it has been i've been writing that for five years and so i think that there's i think the drafts and the, the things that i focused on have changed multiple times but the main takeaway is that i guess i would say that there is a an idea of people are an intuitive idea that people are happy about the eu or other similar types of democratic institutions regulating new technologies and new infrastructure technologies, whether that's Facebook, whether that's fiber optic kind of dissemination, whatever it is. Um, 
and <clears throat> that there's not a lot of thought and there's like a sense that they're in the in the countries taking over this regulation that i would say there is a false sense of let's say americans or canadians having a sense that they're getting they're being represented or they're getting some type of democratic buy in to these super big tech companies that are free from debt like okay if you're regulating them then we're then we're basically like if a if a country is regulating them there is some type of there's some type of accountability measurement that's happening on them that is relevant to me and i wrote this paper which was basically trying to highlight the fact that the gdpr comes to bear all of a lot of european regulation comes to bear on the us and canada but there is actually no type of like i don't vote in the eu i have nothing to say about eu policies i don't have any type of say in kind of like how these regulations come so there's actually no democratic connection at all it's actually no better more or less than these companies that are making rules about me there's absolutely no solution that is come it is actually a very false promise that is coming from the EU or from all of these other countries and in fact if we're going to be cynical about it and i don't really get into this in the paper i i can't remember whether i do or not if we're being cynical about it there is in the jack goldsmith and the early tim wu days of 2006 who controls the internet this argument that basically this is a seizure of control using control over companies to seize control of a new realm of like state power and to kind of take over these types of companies and to tax them or regulate them to bring them to heel and to take a bite out of kind of the effervescent entrepreneurial Silicon Valley like domination that has happened for the last 20 years. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that's kind of the thesis of the paper more or less. I can't remember what it's called right now. Everyone hates the name digital democracy deficit. Um, I'll just say that. That was what it was originally called. I can't remember if that's what it was called when I sent it to you. Yeah, that's um, what I've, I I think it's a great name. Oh, really? <laughs> like people yeah, hate it? I think it's a terrific <laughs> name. I mean, because the, the root case you keep coming back to is the point you just made, which is, okay, but who gets to have a say on that? Who gets to have a democratic say on the process? What if we called okay. it the digital democracy deficit at Ohio State? <laughs> Then I'd have to no, pull that's, it to that's, uh, and I, I, burn it in a fire. <laughs> exactly. We'd burn it in the bonfire before the game against the team up north. Um, the um, Kate, there are, there are so many different places you can grab onto, onto this. I know. Um, but, you know, so, so I mean. It also kind of came from a naive place. It was like a, I knew, like once I was I don't doing think it's it, naive. Like, oh, and the fascinating thing is that, 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 that we end up in very much the same place at the end, although you don't spend enough time talking about it as a solution. But we'll come back to that. But yeah. there, but you got this, <clears throat> you've got this point about, you know, there's there's one was one theory that says networks are more powerful than nations, all right, and um, and that wow, this is this whole new structure, and then you've got this other one that says that no networks have allowed nations to extend their authority um, into places where they've got no right to. <clears throat> and um, and how do we solve that? And um, and the problem is, I mean, the, that uh, you tend to approach it, and first of all, I think it's a terrific paper. It is a very stimulating paper. Um, but you approach it in terms more of the speech issue. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, and, 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 you know, there are, there are multiple components. There's the privacy issue. There's the competition issue. There's the speech issue. And they, and the question is, how do you fit them all together? And the problem is they, they, they all end up tripping over each other on one way or another in terms really? of, in terms of solutions. But, um, the, so I had two general reactions. First of all, um, is you get to the same point that I get to um, at the end of your paper, uh, which is that interoperability is the name of the game. Yeah. And, you know, the fascinating thing that's happened is that the Internet, which was originally called Internetworking, and got shortened to internet because all it is 
is disparate, previously incompatible networks made compatible by a lingua franca called IP. Mm-hmm. And um, and and at the and the secret of the internet is this interconnection and interoperability. And on top of that, then, let me back up. You were talking about the history of and wires and all this sort of stuff, and you're looking yeah. at the history. So, what was the telephone company? The telephone company was was a and you know Theodore Vail built AT and T on the basis that it was a natural monopoly because you couldn't have more than one provider because the technology was so damn inefficient, right? Mm-hmm. You have to open up a circuit and keep it running for the whole time, even when there's no sound, when somebody's breathing used to, and then you got to have that circuit available for Mother's Day, even though it's never going to be used the rest of the year. And, um, and, and, and that is so damn inefficient that only a monopoly can do it. And so give me a fair rate of return and I'll run your monopoly for you. And then we'll argue about what the fair rate of return is. Along comes the internet and and says, no, we're gonna we can have an open network here. I mean, I, I remember the story. So so Paul Barron, I was I was blessed. It's the only word. I was blessed um, uh, to be able to call Paul Barron, who was the guy who invented packet switching, a friend of mine, and 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 to have learned digital concepts from Paul Barron, which was you know, one of the blessings of my life. But packet switching, just for those who don't know, is breaking up content into a thousand twenty packets of a thousand twenty-four bits and separating them and sending them out over telecommunications infrastructure separately, reassembling at the end, and you get your content back. It is similar to the same technology that ended up being used in peer-to-peer sharing to give us kind of Napster and some other types of ideas. But it's it was, also it's similar. A br- to, it's a brilliant. You know, it's, it's like it's it's a brilliant idea. It's a common idea. When they decompose yeah. people and send them to other <laughs> planets, <laughs> so, you know, it's just like they reassemble them at the other end. But but the but the point of the matter is that Paul told the story about when he went to AT and T. Uh, so he, he did this little defense department contract at RAND. RAND, AT&T was running all the networks for the defense department at that point in time. Um, he goes to AT&T at the request of the defense department and says, uh, hey, here's the technology that will provide more security to make sure we can survive and, and keep our second strike capability. And, um, and AT&T looks at him and says, are you crazy? We're never going to build something like that. It'll compete with us. We got this wonderful, inefficient mechanism that we get a rate of return on, and we're never going to do this. So along, but make a long story short, along comes the internet, and it builds this open platform that does what the uh, telephone network didn't do, and that was to provide more openness and more distribution of activity away from centralized sources, centralized uh, uh, switching points. And then along comes the platforms who build a closed superstructure on top of this open network. And in essence, take us back to the problems that we had in the telephone company. All right. So now, how did we deal with those issues, the, the way in which Theodore Vale helped make AT and T the biggest company in the world was he built long lines, long distance, and then said to other phone companies, uh, "You want to uh, you local phone? You want to you want to hook up with me? <laughs> you got to sell to me, or." you're going to have to work some kind of a deal with me. And that was how the Bell system was created uh, by, uh, by, by locking everybody out. That is exactly the same thing that is going on right now. So I've, I post a video on YouTube. Can I get that video onto Facebook? Nope. Okay. 
and and um, and at the same point, and so, so what happens is when 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 the, when the platforms fail to interconnect, they lock in their users and they lock their users out of additional information, additional entertainment, additional experiences, whatever the case may be. And um, and so if you were to have uh, 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 an open access, internet interconnection, interoperability um, as a requirement for the networks, you could do it on a relatively light touch uh, uh, regulatory basis. You don't have to micromanage uh, the whole thing. And in so doing, you would open up and allow, um, in essence, consumers by their choices to make the kinds of decisions that Kate was lamenting that governments and others are so crappy at. Yeah. Um Okay, so a couple of things, and I really want your take on this, um, because this is not part of that article, but part of another article that came about as doing a bunch of the antitrust research that I was doing in the la uh, over the last six months. Um, and it relates directly to interoperability and the points you made. So I would actually endeavor to say that YouTube and Facebook are decently interoperable. Um, I can, like right now, Crowdcast is streaming live on YouTube. And if I wanted to, it would be I could be streaming live on on Facebook. And but like nobody watches it on Facebook, so we don't stream. No one live watches it on Facebook, Facebook so there's interesting audience. No, 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 but that, that is not interoperable. That is that is saying I'm going to have a stream for Facebook, a stream for YouTube, right? That is not what saying. I, so define I, your your so inter, what your interoperability email, for video would look like. Email is interoperable. Okay, oh, okay. I send you something on Gmail. You send it back to me on Outlook.com, and and um and and everything is is even. You talk about it in your article. You talk about about what the FCC required of uh of of AOL. So what's um, not interoperable about we we're streaming? We could uh, they're separate. Could... They're interconnect. They're not. They're separate. They're right. not like going to a universal hub or an identity for you. They're going to separate. They're they're I'm not matching separate they're identities. Designed, separate. They, are, they are designed not to work with each other. If yeah. you want to have this work, you then have to end up building the bridge or the scab or whatever to to, to solve that problem. And um and and I, so so the problem with misinformation. I mean, of the many problems with misinformation, the problem with misinformation. One of the problems with misinformation is so I get trapped in a social media platform that treats the news they give me the same way they treat the ads they give me, which are, what do you want to see, Tom? And I can't change the channel. I can't yeah. go from Fox to MSNBC. I'm stuck. Yeah. What what you're talking and and what you're talking about, Ben, is you as the is the information provider for in lieu of fun have to build a bridge between a couple of services because those services themselves have been defined by their own operating rules so as not to interoperate because that is what is best for them because that's how they trap their consumers and that's how they trap their data. So, so, what, would is, a, so what would an interoperable environment look like right now? I can tell you. This is exactly like, so this is exactly the AOL Time Warner merger that, 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 that Tom is referring to. Um, so still the biggest merger i think approved um that has ever happened in u.s history um between time warner and aol um the fcc made a ton of conditions uh for this merger to go through um i would say that one of the most minor and under discussed <laughs> conditions that like possibly happened in aol time warner merger was i think this was in 2003 that this was that it was essentially that they AOL Time Warner make their 
or so AOL makes their instant messaging platform interoperable. What do we mean by interoperability in this context? Well, it meant that basically they were going to hew their code to like one uniform principle. If you had one handle, you could talk to people that were on ICQ, on MSN Messenger, on AOL, and that you could have a third party open source like software engineer, like create a program that put them all together in one place so that like, instead of having, as we have today, and this it, is an interesting kind of like interjection that I want Tom's thoughts on about with speaking of solutions, uh, instead of today having Instagram DMs and Facebook Messenger DMs and WhatsApp DMs and Snap DMs and TikTok just have DMs, DMs and everything. just to have DMs in like some type of like universal function. And guess what? So, so there was a couple of reasons that I think that like people didn't understand how serious this was. And it kind of gets into the idea that like, you have to understand the anthropological and social functions that these things play in each other's lives. And I was in a very unique point in my life when AOL became interoperable. I was 15 or 16 and I was like, depended on it to talk to all of my friends. This was the new way that everyone like discussed things. And so we all moved over to AIM, which was a free service called, it was called ADM, sorry, it was at ADM, which was like, uh, I don't actually, it was like it, what the acronym was for. Um, but it was a free service that lasted, I don't know, for 10 or 15 years. And it combined all of these interoperable instant messaging. And about three years after AOL agreed to these terms, of all of the terms that the FCC levied on that merger, the only one that came crawling back to the FCC to revoke two and a half years later was the interoperability elements for instant messenger. And I ask you why, like why, like this seems like this trivial little thing. People don't get message like ads in their instant messenger. Well, they were sitting. There's two things. AOL was subscription based. You paid per minute that you were on the service. Okay. And then you, so if you hung out and talked to your friends all day on AIM or like on AOL instant messenger, you were paying per minute for that service Two, it was also an ad based service. So you were seeing ads. And so like the second that people just signed on to check their mail and then signed off and no one browsed through the shitty, shitty landscape that was AOL and like the, like the nineties and two thousand. I mean, it was like literally just like Google, like AOL screenshot in like 2000 and you will get a sense of like, it was just, it was ugly. Paula wasn't born yet. I know Paula wasn't born yet, but the, I think she was, but anyways, but there was like basically this, I, but like there was this, they came crawling back. And the reason was that like, basically, essentially, like at the end of the day, and I, I'm starting to maybe think that this is my hill to die in, is that the, the internet just wants, like the, like the internet is going to just be a, a function for connecting people. And that like, people want to be able to talk to each other. The internet, and is, the internet is a function for connecting people. Yes. That has been perverted by those who built superstructures on top of it that then hide behind walls yes. the services that they do but they 100 so, so there's but there's two things first of all they uh, there's a the, the, the good news and the bad news of what we're talking about here <clears throat> the reason this was a simple thing for the fcc to con to, to contemplate is that the fcc speaks the interconnection part of this yeah they speak interconnection you know i mean the the that the, they regulated uh forever the interconnection and interoperability of the telephone companies and um and so when you come with a problem like this oh yeah we can solve this with interconnection the bad news about interconnection and the challenge that we have to deal with along the, the way here is that is that there just like there was an incentive to um to mess with an open network and make it closed, there are also capitalistic and human incentives to screw around with interconnection that says that somebody has to be in charge. <clears throat> so let me go let me go one step further because as you know, what um, what what several of us have proposed, Phil Verveer, who was the person who signed the order breaking up AT and T, okay, for the Justice Department, okay. Uh, and Gene Kimmelman, um, one of America's foremost 
consumer advocates now at the Department of Justice, and I put together this proposal that we developed up at Harvard when we had all our time because you wouldn't see us, Ben. Um, and, um, and, and, and what it was proposing was that we need to have a new regulatory paradigm that mm -hmm. steals from what works in the, um, in the technology world and um and for for technical standards and applies them to behavioral standards um that are enforceable yes by an agency of government and so you come out and you say okay so so for so there are n plus one interoperable technical standards i mean there's good here's one example right now there is a standard being created right now called matter m-a-t-t-e-r which is for all of the devices in your home to be able to be interoperable and talk to each other. Apple, Google, all the big guys, uh, Amazon that are having in, in home devices are working on this to make sure they can all talk to each other. That's a really good idea. Um, I don't see a problem, Dave. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Al. <laughs> um, the, ah, but, sorry. <laughs> but, but, but the point of the matter is that that we don't go to the next step, which is what are the consequences of that? What are the behavioral consequences of that? And how do we try and get in front of those behavioral consequences in the same way that we try and get in front of the technical consequences? Yeah, totally. And 100%. um and. And, and so and so that means that you you don't do the kind of, of, of interconnection interoperability regulation that you used to have for the telephone network but you do say you guys will create this standard that will deliver to this and we're gonna watch to make sure it's real and enforce it so it is a it is light touch regulation instead of micromanagement and I think that's why I said you and I end up at essentially the the, the same same point kate no i think uh, that we're on exactly the same page so all right we're gonna go to audience questions matt c the floor is yours okay so this may be a bit off topic i don't know but i'm just really curious i i seem to remember this time back during the obama administration it seemed like a million years ago now but a lot of us including me we got really worked up about this idea called net neutrality, right? Which were, for a lot of reasons, it seemed to make a ton of sense at the time. Like, I've heard of that. Need a rule in this to preserve neutrality or all these bad things are gonna happen. And you could really see where that would be the case, et cetera. And I, I'm, I might be making this up, but I think what happened is we got a rule and it went into effect and then it went away. Like I think a circuit court struck it down or something. No, and it no, ended up no, no, the court, the court upheld it. And the Trump administration came in and killed it at the request of the ISPs. I knew it was one of those two things. Um, Great, but so it went away, and so anyway, we don't have it now. And it seems like either I missed it, or a lot of the bad things that we thought were going to happen either haven't happened, or else I'm too dumb to notice that they did happen. But a lot of people will now say, like, that oh, that was a big. It turns out we were all worrying about nothing, and it turned out to be a big issue that, that, that just kind of went away and wasn't a big issue. Is that true? Or so I think that, that, so. There's yeah. two th there's two things going on there. One is that, yes, um, uh, I think that the companies have been on relative good behavior wanting to show off to support your thesis, okay, number one. Number two is that doesn't mean that it was without pain, however. Um, uh, the big California fire uh, a few years ago, the um, Verizon phones, um, uh, weren't being able to be used because they had reached a point and were being shut down and weren't interoperable. Back to this interoperability question with um, with the network, and um, and so there have been a series of things like that. The inverse, however, of what you're talking about is that the argument that the companies made <clears throat> um, all the way up to the White House was um oh this 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 will chill investment we, we'll we'll never be able to invest and 
build out broadband uh, capabilities if we're such required a bizarre to argument. do this. And the fact of the matter is that in the three years that, that the net neutrality rules in place, investment was greater than in the three years that preceded it. Do you have any expectation that uh, now that uh, uh, the FCC is, uh, the administration has changed again, that, that uh, you will uh, uh, prevail uh, in retrospect on net neutrality and that I the hope FCC so. will, will reinstate it? I hope so. Uh, they need to get a third Democratic commissioner uh, on, uh, but I would hope so. The other fascinating thing is that just last week, um, the uh, Ninth Circuit uh, upheld California's um, net neutrality law, which the Trump administration had tried to argue in that court um, had been preempted by the failure of the federal government to act. <laughs> An interesting legal thesis. Um, and uh, and so I think we're probably also going to see a wave of state net neutrality. I think there's probably a dozen or more state net neutrality rules of one flavor or another out there now as well. This is, I'm not going to like, but Tom, this is why I'm at a state AGs conference. Like literally it is like all the state AGs are like here and there's kind of a conference on tech right now. Um, and so that's like sure what it, to, make sure you talk to Phil yeah. Weiser. Just make sure I can, you break, I can make, make, make sure you guys. can scan. Basically, it's all up to me. <laughs> Itamar, the floor is yours. You have a couple questions. Oh uh, yeah, uh, I I hope uh, I don't take everybody's time. Uh, I think my most upvoted and my first question is a little more tangential, so I'll skip it for now. Uh, so my second question was. Uh, how does interoperability affect privacy, content moderation, and intellectual property? I think that there's some tension there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that 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 uh, Kate talks about in her paper is how do we return friction to the process? And um, and 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 yes, those are friction items. Yes, they have to be dealt with. Yes, they can be dealt with. Matteo Caraba. The floor is yours. You're not out walking. I'm not. It's uh, just a little too cold and pouring rain out, but I'll be out there soon. Um, so my question relates to an experience I had earlier this week that I just found unbelievable at the end of it. I was on the phone with for four hours with, I think, six different people at different points uh, with Frontier Wireless. Uh, and the aim of the call was so I could pay a $55 deposit on a router, uh, which I had to do uh, on a, by reading a credit card number over the phone. Um, and I mean, it was obviously annoying, but it was also just so stunning. I can't believe that this was how it happened. And so my question for you is, does this mean that uh, ISP, or is this a sign that ISPs aren't uh, suffering enough competition or dealing with enough competition? Of course. <laughs> yes, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I was, you know, when I was in my in my confirmation what hearing in, 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 in the Senate, <laughs> in the Senate, I said, you know, what, what do you stand for, Mr. Wheeler? Competition, competition, competition. Um, and um, and there's not enough competition And the, the um, you know, when I was chairman, um, I went to the cable television association and the cable industry is the largest provider of broadband services in the country. And I told them they needed to <clears throat> quit their uh, exclusive franchises and start competing with each other. And, you know, I needed one of those WWF cages to keep the rotten tomatoes from being thrown at me if they, if they could have. Uh, <clears throat> but, but that was one of the things that we worked on. I mean, I, when we when when AT and T wanted to require Direct TV, we said, "Okay, you can do it, but you have to uh, to overbuild 13 million homes so that there will be choice. We have got to have choice." Now, the good news is that we're actually starting to see some choice come into the marketplace. The challenge will be that a duopoly is not necessarily the definition of full competition. Ev, 
Yeah. It's all you. Thanks. Um, so actually, my question is maybe more for Kate. Uh, but of course, uh, I mean, the de facto application of the AU law is a problem. But now what should we do about it? Like they are in a quest to regulate all tech everywhere. So what do you want them to, to do? Or actually, how do you want Strategic America to react? bombing. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's uh, no. nothing that Brussels can do that a targeted campaign of airstrikes cannot prevent. Ben's been watching um, the, the French village. I would like to disassociate myself from that comment just in case there's anybody watching at all. I, uh... No, I mean, like, it's it's actually a more descriptive observation. I don't know what the solution necessarily is. Like, I think it is, it is all about a balancing of power. Like, I don't actually blame the EU. They can't, they're not innovating. They're so behind the ball and in innovating and kind of creating businesses that can compete and kind of launch these types of like large scale platforms that like they just don't, they 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 can't possibly like in my opinion start to compete with some of some of these established um, these established. Oh, there there are like a f couple when I was living in France for like three for three or four months that I like kind of like picked up on some of like the platforms that are unique to EU and are not like aren't terrible and are like you know but they're not searching to go global and it's they are clearly becoming acquired which also adds to this other dimension that we haven't even talked about is when you're acquiring companies that are outside the jurisdiction of the FTC or the FCC um, or in, in some other capacity which is of course kind of the the jurisdiction of the entire makes the, the entire world the jurisdiction i i guess to my my point is really one of like people just need to be very aware that like government is not necessary like any government action is not necessarily a solution and i made this point with kind of it actually wasn't the gdpr it was another privacy provision that got passed around the same time as the gdpr that kind of put the cookies banners on everything and i said this at the time and i like remember fighting with a bunch of like my friends who were lawyers in the eu privacy lawyers in the eu they're like, <clears throat> they're like why do americans hate cookies banners so much i'm like they're just they just like they just are so dumb. They don't tell you anything. People click through them. They create this. They're annoying. They just, they create friction, but not in any of the right ways. And they also give the, the, and this is what I actually think is the most dangerous part. And I think Tom would agree with me. They create the auspice that we've regulated and solved some type of problem when in fact we have not solved so any problem to, at all. Let's go back to first principles here for a second, Kate. Sure. The reason why Europe is out in front on this is because the United States has failed to lead. Okay. Yeah. We have traditionally been the leaders in telecommunications policy and in policy related to new technologies. We have absolutely failed to do it this time around and the void is being filled. Nature abhors a vacuum um, and uh, the, uh, yeah. the, the EU is stepping in, and American states are stepping in, as we talked about a minute ago, uh, with net neutrality, also with privacy. And, um, and, and the fascinating thing is, I wrote a piece about this for, for, for Brookings a while back, in which I quoted Oscar Wilde, um, who has got a great line in, uh, in Lady Windermere's Fan, in which he says, there are two great tragedies in life, not getting what you want and getting it. And the reality is that the lobbying of the U.S. Internet companies, both networks and platforms, have been so successful to keep out any government action that they're now going to find government action still taking place, but in a much less livable kind of a situation for them. But I, but I also think there's an element of this that is, uh, you know, the European sort of continental sure. Sure. regulatory sure. Uh, environment saying, hey, this is an opportunity to jump in and, and create a... Uh, to be relevant... A, Re relevant, but also to, I mean, I, I like to create 
uh, uh, to to limit U.S. hegemony in this area yes. by regulating U.S. companies. Yes. Of course. Yes. But the other side of it is, thank God somebody's stepping up. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, we got a we got a situation right now where the companies are making the rules. So and there is so no Ev, upset. So Ev, you are uh, uh, in an interesting position here. You're Canadian. You're uh, French Canadian. Um, so. What is the dominant on the the companies that you're interacting with? Who is the who is the important regulator? Is it uh, uh, the province of Quebec? Is it the nation of Canada? Is it the United States? Is it the EU? Who most conditions the services that you receive? Um, I the the AU has a lot of impact both in um my interactions with companies and with um how our state regulates uh it's actually interesting to see that here for instance regarding privacy we just uh, adopted uh privacy laws that mimic what is happening uh in the au it's basically like copy copy pasting uh what's happening in the au copy pasting the GDPR. and when you say here do you mean ottawa or do you mean quebec i mean both um the privacy law in in Canada is not it's not super clear where it's at at the moment because uh, we have had elections and uh, it's kind of an old. Uh, but there was a privacy law uh, that has a bill that has been brought up the last session and in Quebec we have been uh, discussing and adopting three privacy laws, uh, which are basically like the, the GDPR. And here we really, really see um, the GDPR and the AI Act and all of that stuff as something wonderful and excellent and super good. Mm -hmm. While when you talk with European, they're much more critique about it, more, more, much more critical about it. Um, but we really, really uh, are in admiration uh, to the way. Yeah. So the fascinating thing is, you know, when, when China, a couple of months ago, put their privacy law in place, they copied the GDPR. Yeah, I Hello. know. I know. You know, I know. And we're still sitting eggs. around in this country sucking eggs on what a federal privacy law should look like. I mean, but I, to, to, to be honest, and I think that one of the things is like, like people are in admiration for these privacy laws. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're good or effective. Like the uh, fact that they've gotten right. So like, I, I just want to like, I just want to kind of like say like, we are like, I couldn't talk to anyone about how stupid I thought the cookies banners were even five years ago. And uh, anytime I was in Europe, I had to deal with them. It was like fine. And now I deal with them every day in the U S and if I'm in like some type of emergency and trying to click through things, they are so, so annoying. But here's like, the thing. So let me just look at Kate. I just, I totally agree, you know, and you get, and you get fatigue, you get, you know, a, a, you're constantly being reminded, click here fatigue. But so, so we passed when I was chairman, we passed a privacy law for a privacy rule for networks or ISPs. Um, making that decision, you know, governing is difficult. <laughs> Having to make decisions because people from one side came in and said, oh, this is terrible, this is awful. People from the other side came in and said, oh, this isn't enough. But the fact of the matter is you've got to start moving forward. I don't think the GDPR is the end of the road on privacy for Europe, let alone for us. Yeah. And um, but we have begun the process, which is a hell of a lot better than where we are in this country. So 67 days into the Trump administration, the Republican Congress passed a law repealing the privacy rule that we put in place at the FCC. So there are no privacy rules at all. And yep. none is worse than one that may not be perfect. No, no, no. Of course. Of course. I, I like, and like, no, I think you're exactly right. The, the thing that like, I guess I'm, and I, we should get to Paula's question, but the thing that I was kind of like pointing out is like, 
there are the, like, if we revisited these, that would be great. But like, we can't, you know, that there is like, there does seem to be like, at least in the US, such a like a crisis of any type of being able to revisit them or like kind of address them that it just is, uh, you know, is very difficult, but I agree with you entirely. Um, Paula? Um, yeah, so I have a question that kind of KK sort of jumped on, which was through social media apps, which is DMing. And one of the things that if you're on social media, as you'll notice, is that when it comes to the very addictive like videos or like memes, it's a lot of screenshots or screen recordings because you can't send posts in a very efficient way through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. But what you do see is Instagram being flooded with screen recordings from TikTok, which kind of keeps Instagram alive in some sense. But then the double-edged sword would be if I didn't, if I could share content and other people could share content from Instagram to Twitter, for example, then there would be no use for Instagram. And so it's kind of a double edged sword on sharing those contents. And so I was wondering what you think of it, because in some sense, I think if tick, if Instagram couldn't get that content from TikTok, it would probably be dying out, which is why it had to replicate the real feature. Um, and I do have to say it's kind of obligatory because I go to Michigan Law that we be OSU this year. So I have to say that. <laughs> well, I mean, I, so I, you know, on both of those points, um, the, 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 the second and most outrageous point, um, I think that once a decade is well, okay. Like if you win once every 10 years. What was that quote they, that you had about tragedy? Like, <laughs> like, like it's not having it and then getting it or like <laughs> or something. Anyway. But hold on. What was the first bit you so, were going to no, say? The first, point, the first point is, I mean, that, 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 that the, the problem is, yeah, somebody can take a tweet and put it over on an Instagram or vice versa or whatever. That is not interconnection. That is yeah. not giving the the individual that, that that is making the individual become the network host rather than saying, wait a minute, we're gonna make sure all of this stuff works together. That's the whole you know. Yeah. All right, Dr. Doom, you get the last question today. Hi, Just thanks. Um boy, there's so much to say about this, but I I, I think one central uh one central interoperability issue just hits me over and over again, which is the take the taking over of the social graph by Facebook. It is, you know, we don't let the human genome, a fact of nature, be proprietary. The social <laughs> graph is a fact of nature of society. Why in the world have we allowed one company to monopolize it? I mean, Craig Ventner spent lots of money doing you know getting part of the genome but he wasn't allowed to keep it and there's yep. no reason for facebook to be allowed to keep the genome of our society you agree with that okay well yeah so just, what are your what are your thoughts on that uh is there a difference between the human genome and the social graph yes I mean, I think that there's a ton of difference. I also don't think like a TikTok is not run off of the social graph at all and has exactly the same kind of like, um, and has has more rapidly, like has gained the same number of users that, well, at least until last quarter, like same number of users that Facebook has in, in like one third of the amount of time. Um, and it has nothing to do with the social graph. Um, it has to do with a lot of other things and in infrastructure and interoperability that Tom and I were talking about. But I, I think that the social graph, and maybe I am like totally wrong on this because I was having a fight about this with an economist this week and she was saying that basically, you know, well, what if I want to say something about my grandmother dying? Then Facebook monopolizes that space. And I was like, but you have like, but does it like you could still call people and tell them like you can still have plenty of Pshaw. other ways. Pshaw, yeah, you could you like, could you could take out a quill pen and uh, write and dip it in ink or you could carve into stone or a wax tablet 
Yes, I completely no, no, no. agree with you. No, actually. no, that no, no, of course that's like of course you could still do that. It doesn't like completely get to it. I see I see the point, but like I actually I, agree I, with you. All I, I just previous technologies are available. I mean, they kind of are and like I also just kind of think that like it increasingly makes it, it just doesn't like I I mean like people like the 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 fact of the US Postal Service didn't stop Bell Technologies from being broken up right. and like I, but I also don't understand why that was or wasn't a good thing at the end of the day like maybe that did lead to the internet being created or maybe it led to like the death so, of So Tom is Kate phone? wrong? Yeah, I don't know. Of course she is. No, I'm sorry. What was the question? <laughs> um I mean, it was essentially kind of like is the social graph is does Facebook have a monopoly on the social graph? Has yes, it basically... no, so, but the question is what you're you're looking at the social graph saying, okay, so can I operate as an individual without the social graph? I'm looking at the social graph and saying, look at how Facebook uses it as a tool of domination. Fair enough. Okay. I mean, we're dealing with two sided yeah. market here, right? And we got to look at both sides of the market. I think that's right. Yeah. We are going to leave it there. Tom Wheeler, you're a great American. Let me know when you're going to be in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, because I don't get to see you in Washington, even though we work like next to each other at the I Brooklyn was Institution. Say that. Don't you so we got to go up to Cambridge to have a drink. <laughs> Kate Klonick, enjoy Vale. Don't pretend too much to I'm, be hanging out I'm with only, the AGs. Hey, Kate. I'm Kate, only there to see my brother, honestly. He's like in Colorado. So I'm like, this one is request. Him. One yeah. request. Go go find Phil Weiser, Attorney General. That's why I'm of here. That's why, that's why Phil, Phil? Phil invited me. That's why I'm okay. speaking here today. So Phil I'm is sure the leading I know. AG I in the United States on understanding tech. It's incredible. He's, Tell him I said hi. That, no. 100%. This is his conference. So that's why that's why I'm here for Phil. He's just the best. So completely agree. We will be back on Monday evening, five o'clock. Kate and Scott will by then have figured out who a guest is going to be. I have no idea who the guest is going to be. It's not my problem because it's Monday and Monday is their day. Uh, that'll be a bunch of hours and uh, 56 minutes from now. And until then, Kate... Uh, I just realized I think I'm going to be a plane on Monday. So <laughs> no, we'll figure we're going to talk about this offline. Yeah. <laughs> but don't... Um, I will. Uh, uh, until then, uh, everyone just, you know, pick up your nearest and dearest rotary phone and uh, and use it to make a long distance call. To because Tom that's Moore. the only conversation that you can have without Facebook. And tell them how great. And, sit and just yell into the phone, go blue, and then hang up. <laughs> oh, Kate, you, hit, you know, this is, you do get the last word. Mm. See you in a month.